Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again. You can call me Matt, and I'm here with Gene, uh, the strategy wargamer, uh, who is back again, and we're back again, and I, this is a, I'm gonna fucking edit this. This, this is terrible. <laughs> I can't start a podcast off anymore. Nice. <laughs> anyway, um, so <laughs> we're back. It's episode 14 of the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. It's been about a week and a half since our last episode was posted, um, although we haven't actually recorded in quite a while, there's been a lot of uh, developments in uh, strategy gaming. Yeah, a lot of games coming out um, yeah. in the last couple of weeks, and I've been playing a lot of them. I know, I believe, Gene, you've been playing them a lot as well, but uh, uh, we're going to dive into that here in a few moments. But how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I, uh, you know, it's getting a little hot in here in Virginia, which is uh, what I like. Uh, very, uh, you know, I prefer the heat over the cold, but. Uh, so it, it gave me a lot of time to, uh, you know, whip out my uh, laptop and uh, play some. Uh, I got to uh, I play that uh, carry deck that, uh, that just came out uh, not too long ago. Uh, you, you played it too, right? I mean, it was like uh, two weeks ago it came out. And uh, what did you think? Yeah, I've uh, I've been playing it a bit on my channel. And I'm kind of torn on it. I... There are, there are moments in that. So for those of you who aren't aware, carrier deck is a... Ah. A game which basically puts you in the shoes of a off. I don't know if there's a real responsibility for it, but an officer who's essentially in charge of the deck of a U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier, um, and it's it's very much in the vein of like a mobile game where you've got stars and um, you know achievements in the same sort of like an iPad type game, which it is available on iPad, but it basically yeah, puts you. Price, I think it's like nine ninety nine. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm not that into mobile gaming. I know you're probably more in tune with than it, more in tune with it than I am, um, in terms of what what's normal. Um, but it's interesting. It's a time management game. It's it's published by Matrix and Slytherin, and it's not the kind of game that they usually publish. I enjoy a lot of it. It can get pretty hectic, uh, as with a lot of mobile games. They kind of throw increasingly levels, increasingly uh, rapid levels of difficulty. It, it it very much becomes a how quickly can you manage to click things kind of in the right order, but also um, in the vein of a, an aircraft carrier, right? So you're in charge of a, the, the deck of a U.S. aircraft carrier. The enemy is very nebulous. It's just kind of a you have incoming threats that show up on kind of the bottom of the map as kind of a threat board that, that come in. You've got to manage sending AWACS out. You've got to manage sending uh, anti-submarine aircraft out. You've got to put together strikes against incoming threats. Um, in some ways, it's almost like a modified tower defense game. But what I really enjoy about it, because I'm not usually in, into those kind of games, but I think the mo the carrier aspect is intriguing to me because when you get your planes going, like when you get in an intensive mission uh, further into the game and you've got three planes taking off simultaneously with a plane landing, meanwhile you're trying to move aircraft across the deck and not have things collide because they will blow up if you land a plane on top of each other. Yeah, anyone... uh, explosions too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as anyone who has seen any of my streams will know. Um <laughs> It's it, it gets that feel right a fair amount of time. Like I, I remember thinking as I was playing through one, one of these scenarios, I had three planes that I quickly launched in succession, maybe in like two or three seconds. So you had the the vapor coming up from the deck as the, car, the, the aircraft rushes off the catapult, and then another one, and then another one. Meanwhile, an aircraft was landing, and I was trying to get you know another aircraft out of the way. And right in that moment, I thought, wow. This really kind of captures what you imagine, what you see when you look at footage of U.S. aircraft carriers in action. Now, that is often overlaid with a um, more of a, again, it's a time management game. So more of the kind of, uh, all right, click, click, click real quick and, and get things um, just done so rapidly that you don't necessarily have time to sit back and enjoy it. It's got some interesting camera angles to the game where you can like watch aircraft come in and land and watch aircraft take off. But I guess one of the things that I was difficult for me was I rarely ever got to witness that. I rarely ever got to see and experience those great moments because I was so busy trying to figure out how to get the next plane out of the way of another aircraft that was coming in and landing. So that was it, it's. It's an intriguing game. It's not a war game. It's a it's a time management game. 
but it's fun and I found myself enjoying it more than I thought I would. It's just from a from a visual perspective, I wish I had time to take in the sights a bit more because um, I think that's one of those things that, you know, a game that looks at the deck of an aircraft carrier and, and managing managing all of that, you'd want to be able to take in the sights and sounds. Which it has great audio, by the way, that really makes you immersed in it. It's just a yeah. matter of you. you never... like, yeah, I like the uh, thing, the audio background where they're like, you know, they got like um, basically what the tower is always saying is just like, you know, we got you know Eagle One coming in, you know, like just that side conversation while you're playing. It it, it kind of immerses you. I like that. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it doesn't. So when when you're when you send aircraft off, they just kind of vanish off the map, and and then they they don't ever really. I mean, they engage enemies, but it's all off map. Really, your focus is strictly limited to the carrier. So that's why I'd say it's not really a war game. Uh, again, it's very much a time management game. But I found myself enjoying it more than I thought I would. It's just one of those things where there were times where I, I wanted that fast-paced action, but I wanted the ability to step back and enjoy it, like almost like an autopilot or something like that. So I could just step back and watch aircraft land, watch them take off, and, and kind of enjoy the moment. It reminded me of... Uh, well, it reminded me of... Uh kind of you know when i was playing it, it reminded me something like this oh god you're gonna get us copyright flagged um <laughs> no but <laughs> so no i mean like when i was playing the game i mean the beginning it took me a while to get used to it but uh toward like the middle i would say after about 40 50 minutes once i got used to the ui because the ui took some time to uh get used to it um I, you know, I felt kind of like the CAG, you know, like in Top Gun. I felt like, you know, being in the, uh, I, you know, I'm not a Navy guy. So uh, the control room, I guess, or the, you know, the, the poorly lit room where all the big uh, guys are, uh, you know, with the cigar in my hand and, you know, trying to figure out where the nearest MIG is and saying, you know, uh, all those CAG related references, like get on it. You know, uh, I did feel a little bit like that. So. So, I, I, but it, I guess my my retort would be the CAG is more involved in the actual combat operations, and I think it's important for anyone who's considering the game to understand you're really not. You're basically told by you know whoever's in charge, hey, we've got an incoming air threat, and you need to take it out before it hits the carrier. But all you do is you send the aircraft off, and then and it it, it does up. everything on its own. You put together yeah, the packages. Know, I, I there's gonna be more uh, interaction there. Yeah, which I'm fine with. Again, I I I, I think basically be, being what amounts to a tower control or, you know, a, a air traffic controller uh, for just the carrier is fine. And, and I just, it's, I think it's a paradox of a game like this where to make it challenging, you've got to make it fast paced and difficult to manage, but you know, to, and also in order to really get that experience that you're looking for, things do need to be fast paced, but if you don't have a moment to sit back and watch and enjoy the sights and sounds, then you're, you're kind of missing out a piece of, of what, this game has to offer you um did you would this be a game that you'd be uh, repeatedly going back into like play throughout the year or is it just more like a casual like hey i got five ten minutes to kill um it's more than a five ten minute game just because the scenarios typically i think last 10 to 15 minutes um but what i would say is it's the kind of game i think i'll probably be going be going back to from time to time um, you know, it's, I think it's a nice change of pace. Uh, I'm not always looking for a, you know, very cerebral, um, you know, in-depth strategy, strategy game. Sometimes I just want to kind of sit back and kind of click buttons and, and just kind of, you know, shoot the breeze, if you will. Um, I think this is the kind of game that, that I will find myself coming back to in that fashion. Um, but it, it all depends on what, you know what i'm in the mood for you know what this game reminded me of I, when i was uh playing it and then i was i was playing the game i did a review and then i was watching some of the footage that you had from uh cold waters uh which i'm planning to uh play in the next couple of days uh so these two games kind of like reminded me i was like you know what this is a game i played back in the day that I, that gave me everything i wanted from a naval game like 90 percent 90 95 percent right and I was going through it, and I was going through, like, GameSpot, and I was like, what game was it? And you know what I discovered it was? It was Jane's Fleet Command. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but this was a game where you control, you know, actual, like, large fleets. You know, you had an aircraft carrier. You could send um, planes out from there. Uh, you had to intercept enemy aircraft. 
Uh, they were actual missions. I mean, you were in charge of the entire fleet from destroyers, aircraft carriers, to submarines. Um, and you can do specific things with each of them. And it was one of those games that, you know, it, it was, um, it kind of, it was probably one of the best naval combat simulations I've played. I can't recall any ones that I've played recently that were as good or better than that one. Yeah, I would say, I mean, Fleet Command, I played that a bit as well growing up, and it definitely tried to tackle the um, the challenge and the difficulty of a modern naval engagement with a 3D interface. So I would say Command Modern Air, Air Naval Operations in every regard is that Jane's Fleet Command experience and then some. It's a vastly superior and new uh, game out there with a lot more complexity, a lot more uh, depth behind it. It 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 reflects modern warfare more um, holistically, I think, than than Jane's Fleet Command. But what Fleet Command had that I think a lot of those kind of games, for example, like the the Harpoon series, which uh, combat Ma combat mission is based or not combat mission, um, Command Modern Air Naval Operations is based on. Uh, is both of those games, both Harpoon and, and Command uh, Modern Air Naval Operations, lack a 3D element, which for some people doesn't matter. And actually, they probably have more they can do by having a 2D interface because you don't have to worry about you know the taxing the graphics on a on a computer if you're trying to show a hundred tomahawks that are being launched and and hitting their targets all simultaneously while you've got 30 ships just offshore. Like if you've got to render that all in 3D. You know, your scale is going to be a lot less. Jane's did a really good job of, of doing that. It was scaled down a little bit, but I think it was appropriate for it, its time, right? I think it was a it was like a mid-1990s game. The user interface was kind of clunky and, and, and crappy, and it was still kind of in the early days of 3D imagery where, you know, the, the 3D ships were pretty blocky and, and kind of, um, you know, it wasn't a modern... Uh, modern 3d game in that sense but there there was something appealing to, to see your sm2s you know launch out of the the vertical launch cells on a on an aegis class destroyer uh and and streak toward an incoming cruise missile and, and intercept it or you know hear the roar of your phalanx guns you know trying to take out missiles as they close in i thought where fleet command struggled uh was with air operations outside of a fleet defense role uh, for like your destroyers. I thought the scale that it represented was very small in terms of like if an enemy airstrike was launched against you, it was probably five or six aircraft. If you were launching interceptors, it was probably three or four. You could theoretically put together larger air wings, but the UI was so clunky that I never found myself with more than a handful of aircraft in the air. So I thought it did a great job as a destroyer simulator. That was where I always had the most fun with it was, you know using my surfaced air missiles to intercept incoming threats while launching cruise missile strikes or anti-ship missile strikes against enemy oppositions uh, and often kind of frantically trying to, to shoot down swarms of incoming missiles and being able to see that all in 3D was very, very appealing. So in that sense, it was it was a very good game. It was a Jane's you know combat simulation game, so it had all the depth and detail that you would expect from those 1990s Jane's games. It just didn't, it, it, it didn't, do it for me in the sense that I I don't think combat operations would be on that small a scale when you're talking about aircraft carriers being involved. I don't think I'm going to be launching two F-14s to intercept an incoming raid. I'm probably going to be launching 12 or 14 or 20. And, you know, and I never got the sense it did a great job with modeling large scale air combat in the way that combat or in, in the way that um, command modern air naval operations does. Um, yeah, but I think because it was so like it was so young. I remember I think it was uh, ninety nine. It came out. So I mean, I, I feel like if they continued making that game, revising it, enhancing the UI, um, add seventeen years to that, you know, I think they would be competing with that game very very efficiently, or po possibly surpassing it in terms of UI. Because you know, you know, enhancing it over the years, I, I'm sure they would take uh, customer feedback and say, hey, this is clunky, fix it, and you know. Yeah, but Jane, they don't make games anymore, do they? I don't think Jane's makes games anymore. No, but that's the sad thing is because they made some really good games, and I I, I miss that, you know. And um, you know, they, I mean, they, ha I mean, Fleet Command uh, for its time was, I mean, those three D uh, graphics were blotchy and weren't 
that good. But for 99, that was state of the art. That was like, that was IMAX for 99, you know? <laughs> it was just like, holy crap, look at this. I can see this is an actual ship, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so for 99, it was pretty good. But uh, I, I'm surprised that it must have not done well in sales, but it's hard to hard to kind of like visualize that it didn't because there's so many war gamers out there that played it. So, you know, I, I wonder if it was some other thing that kind of uh, made James kind of say, you know, forget about that space. I don't know if it didn't do well. I mean, it, it the rights they sold to someone else who now sells Fleet Command without the Jane's name and it's on uh, Steam. Um, but as far as, I mean, it may have done well for its time. I think it was just one of those things where as technology did advance and as games did get more taxing and, and more graphically representative, uh, the the number of units you had to sell was constantly increasing if you were going to break even. And, you know, with with wargaming and those those kind of games, um, even if they do well within their own market segment, even if wargamers love it, it doesn't really matter if, if, you know, if the market itself is too small. I think that's kind of what you saw before... Before Steam came in and there was sort of this rebirth of computer gaming, I think you saw the, the wargaming market become very niche, very isolated, and more mainstream production values like Fleet Command tried to have just weren't sustainable uh, for, a, for a period of time in there. You know, but the one thing I do miss is like uh, when I was, uh, I think it was like 2000, 2001 or uh somewhere around there when I was going in the military, I, I remember like I used to take like a weekly trip to the uh, game spot or whatever uh, electronic store that they had there and seeing that all those indie titles, well, not indie titles, but like all those games stacked on the shelf. I mean, there was something really, I don't know, something very special about that. You know, I mean, I love Steam. Don't get me wrong. Steam is great. You know, you can play it on multiple computers, this and that. Um, but, you know, there was something special about going to the store and seeing, like, a game like, holy crap, what game is this? This is, like, before the internet really took off. And, you know, like, you're grabbing it and you see James Fleet Command or Superpower. I don't know if you guys all remember Superpower, but, like, looking at the back, it's like, wait, I can play any country, you know, and you, like, you grab your game you run back home and, you know, you load it up and you're like, holy crap, this is this is awesome. And um, Steam is great and I love it. They have some sales, but I miss the box copies. I never buy box copies anymore because... Pretty much everybody buys it off Steam and I feel like, you know, I miss the box art. You know, I know Slytherin and Matrix games still uh, still gives you the option to get the uh, the box art, right? Like the, they still won't let you do that. Yeah, well, and I, I'll still buy it from time to time depending on the game. I got the uh, War in the, which by the way, I need to give this game a look because I, I bought it and I barely touched it. But I got the War in the West manual uh, with oh. the box copy and it's like a 300 page full color text. It almost looks like a textbook in school. <laughs> um, it's, it's brilliantly done. I just haven't had a chance to, to give the game an actual spin. I played it a little bit, just not as much as I would like. Um, but yeah, I know I hear what you're talking about. We used to go to North Carolina a lot. My, my sister went, uh, went to high school there and we used to go there for, um, three or four times a year road trips. And all along the way, we'd stop at, you know, all these different kind of stores. Sometimes we'd end up in malls. And I just remember, you know, for whatever reason, one of the distinct memories that's in my head is just going to a, a bookstore and finding a random Civil War game on the Battle of Antietam that I'd never heard of before. Or, you know, going to a mall and finding this, and I, I wish I could remember, you know, remember what it was, but there was it might have been a harpoon game, but it was some kind of naval combat game just randomly on the shelf somewhere and thinking, oh my goodness, this is awesome, and never buying it because I never really had a gaming rig growing up. But um, it was it was just one of those interesting things that I think you, you used to find a lot of gems, uh, and maybe they were bad games, I don't know, but you used to find these just random it's gems a, as you kind of go you know, just anywhere in the country and, and you, you end up in a random store and you can find these games and they were cheap and, and maybe that was part of the problem. No one was buying them. They were always in bargain bins. I don't know. Um, the only time I ever get that kind of experience still is if I go to like a half price books or something like that where they, they've got um, you know, second, second, second hand games and they still have a pretty good game selection and, and occasionally I'll find something there that I, that I hadn't discovered before. But there was just something appealing to that, right? Just kind of finding an unexpected treasure uh, a, a, in a store that you know you weren't expecting to find. Yeah, unfortunately, those uh, those days are gone. Talking about unexpected treasures, I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I'm going to segue into Battlestar Galactica here. Oh boy, <laughs> I'm going to use that as a segue here. So, uh, 
did you watch the uh the the stream yesterday it was yesterday yeah did you watch the stream yesterday from uh Slytherin? I had to work, so I uh, I did not uh, watch a majority of the stream. My lunch overlapped with part of it, so I was able to jump in for maybe like the last, I think it was like the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, oh, those were best. And it was, it was pretty impressive. It looked it looked interesting. I guess I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to pick up Starhammer and see how similar this is, because it's made by the same uh, same developer. So Battlestar Galactica, is it called Deadlock, is, uh, is currently, you know, in, in the works with uh, Matrix and Slytherin games, it appears to be a, a tactical space combat game in the Battlestar Galactica universe. I believe during the stream they mentioned that everything they have has been approved and vetted through Universal Studios, so I assume that means everything is canon. Um, but it takes place during the first Cylon War, um, well before the... Uh, well before the... Um, you know, well, he probably would have been a fighter pilot, right? Or a Viper pilot at the time. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, and, and, and allows you to have, you know, space space fleet engagements in that first war. And I think that's kind of cool and exciting. And uh, the stream, it looked gorgeous. Um, I'm, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was sexy. I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, it was just like the, the explosions were amazing. I was saying during while I was watching the, the live stream, I was uh, recording it. I was just like watching it. I was like doing commentary. And I said, you know what? If they decide to make another Battlestar Galactica series, they wouldn't need to do any special effects. They just kept run the game and run the special effects off the game because it was it was it was almost that good to run on an actual television program. It, it was really amazing. I was I was kind of I was shocked that, that like they zoomed up to like this ship. Like, like literally you're like five feet from the ship and you're like looking forward toward the, uh, like you're like in the back of the Battlestar Galactica or whatever Battlestar they were running. And you're like right on top of it and you're looking at the Cylon fleet and you see the missiles streaking over. And it was just like, holy shit, this is like, this is exactly like this show. And I was just watching the show a couple of minutes ago and I was like, man, it, 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 has computer graphics gotten so good that they're measuring up to tv uh computer animation from 10 years ago yeah i don't know if i'd quite go i mean i guess it depends on the episode like i wouldn't i, I it was very pretty it was very well done i don't know if i'd go to the point where it was as good as the tv graphics but it certainly was was very well done um i didn't get a good sense from the piece i watched on how fighter engagements look or you know how, what vipers look like ship to ship looked gorgeous it looked Again, to your point, some of the, the when they zoomed in on a ship that had like its rapid firing kinetic weapons along kind of the, the broad side of the ship that were firing, that did look uh, like it was pulled from the TV series at some point. Um, but uh, I'm thinking of some scenes in like the, the pilot uh, mini series that they did that it kind of reminded me of. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how it looks. I think I'll probably pick up Starhammer, which is made by the same developers and was a space combat game as well, in just like a completely non, you know, uh, a fictional universe made up by the developers. Because I'm really curious if this was, if, if Starhammer was this good uh, looking. Um, you know, obviously we haven't touched the actual game. So, you know, when you get a developer playing a game on a stream, they know all the ins and outs. They know you, they know what to show you. They know what, what not to show you. So... You know, it's there's really campaign side yet. Like, this is supposed to be a big strategic campaign side or semi. Uh, and they and um, they also mentioned during the stream that it was going to be a, a campaign sandbox. So I'm wondering, is it they're just going to give you a map? Here are your fleets, and then you get to move them, kind of like Total War. That's what I'm thinking. Like, they give me. I'm not and... sure. I guess I didn't get that sense from. Uh, the way Starhammer was handled. So that's, again, why I'm kind of intrigued to pick that game up and see because my understanding for that game was there were limited strategic decisions in between battles, and it was kind of a, a linked series of battles that you kind of go down multiple paths. That was my understanding. Um, so I guess we'll see. Um, the one thing I was kind of... I When I was watching it, I you know, this game is in beta, and while they were running the stream, it was about an hour... And I was kind of very impressed, and I, I and I could take based upon their stream that the game is is in the final stages of beta because there were no bugs. It was clean. There was no. I mean, I, I couldn't witness any kind of um, problems while they were playing the game. So at least the tactical portion, I, I I feel like majority of it is nailed down. 
Uh, I don't know about the campaign aspect of it because they didn't show that. So that's probably what they're working on. But um, I have a good feeling that this is this might, you know, be uh, uh, early to mid summer release. I don't I don't I think that there's a possibility of that rather than a, a late summer. release. I don't know. I mean, I asked them and they said it was late summer. So, Gosh. you know, again, remember, I, I agree. It looked good. It looked clean. I fully would expect any competent developer would make sure they're not showing off the issues or the pieces that aren't finished yet in a live stream game reveal, right? I mean, let's realize that part of that's marketing. So I'm not saying there are bugs. I, I hope there are not, and I didn't see any. To your point, it looked brilliantly done. But again, just take that with a grain of salt because you're not going to see it if there is. Um, they're certainly not going to show it to you if there are. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's, and I agree with you. I mean, it, but I mean, for what I see, for what, like, the options, like, they were going into the sub menus, choosing nukes and choosing turrets. Um, if there was a bug, like, for example, if I decided to choose turrets and then go back into the same menu and then flip over to a nuke, that's where a bug would come in and it could crash the game and stuff like that. And I could, I, I see them freely going through that. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it looked clean, but then again, like you were saying, you know, they probably reviewed it and they probably played it a couple of times before they actually did the live stream. Just I'm sure, sure they played it multiple times and I'm sure they knew the exact, you know, sequence of which to click through menus and things like that. Again, I'm not saying anyone's hiding anything, but they wouldn't be doing their job if they didn't make sure that what they were going to show off looked polished. That's my only point. Um, the, uh, I was talking to... Uh, so I had a interview with Marco Minoli, who is the uh, uh, marketing director for Slytherin. I uh, on my uh, I did a podcast with, uh, called War Gamers. If, if you guys are not familiar, it's I, I did a po I released a monthly podcast uh, called War Gamers. You could do it on uh, iTunes and uh, Google Play and stuff like that. And basically, I'm just doing interviews with like um, developers. And I got Marco uh, on the show, and it was. Um, and we were talking about basically everything about Slytherin, but I got on the topic of Battlestar Galactica. And uh, I was asking him how difficult it was going to be to get the, the IP, the intellectual property for Battlestar Galactica. This is, I mean, Universal is not a company that's going to be like yeah, handing this out like candy, you know. So I asked him, I said, so tell me, like, how difficult was it to get it? And he's like, honestly, it was, it, was, it was pretty easy. It was very natural to, um, to make this uh, partnership with Universal. Uh, there were no conflicts, nothing like this. And the follow-up question i had to him which was like the final question to the podcast i'm actually destroying the podcast for you guys so <laughs> this is the fun this, this was the end this was like my highlight and i wanted so to watch that. single malt strategy and don't watch the war <laughs> exactly it, what did you say it was you called the this. war gamers Just podcast like of that. <laughs> what, what was your podcast name again your competing podcast that you're advertising <laughs> you know to, to our audience as if you're trying to siphon viewers away <laughs> no it's just called war gamers uh but basically i you know it's uh where i just you know touch base with uh the industry heads of uh you know like the developers and stuff like that but my the main question i wanted to ask him like i spent 30 minutes or 40 minutes talking to, uh, on the interview with this and i wanted to ask him you got battlestar galactica the game is going to be a hit we all know that i mean it's like if you go to polygon you go all these tech websites they're all saying this is the battlestar game that you've been waiting for so everybody's going to get it it's going to be success and I asked him, I said, I hope so. Well, you never know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, honestly, if it hits like the, to me, if it hits the front page of Polygon, which is a very critical people, uh, and they say, this is the Battlestar game that you've been waiting for. I feel that, honestly, uh, them and a whole bunch of other reviews came in forward saying this is incredible. Uh, now, this is just off the live stream, but honestly, sure. I, I feel it's going. But anyway, the final question <laughs> that I wanted to ask him was, what is the possibility of you going into other IPOs, specifically Star Trek and Star Wars. Because you know, I have a thing about Star Trek. I want to bring back Birth of the Federation, do that thing for uh, strategy uh, gaming. And um, he says it's a very real, po real possibility. Like, I feel like their, their, how do I, their journey to get the Battlestar Galactica license was like, not like he was saying, natural. So I feel like them moving over to different IPs is that they have enough confidence to do so and possibly get it. I, I, while I was talking to them, I even felt like, you know, they, they might even be at, even in talks with, you know, CBS uh, and uh, who owns uh, Star Wars? I think it's uh, Disney now, right? Um, so they might even be in talks right now to bring 
these get these IPs into uh, back into strategy because we we've been we haven't had a good Star Wars, especially Star Trek game strategy game for what like a decade at this point. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I not full on nerd here. I'm not a huge Star Trek fan. I I enjoy. I've watched some of it. I used to watch Voyager a lot growing up, but I guess I'm not someone who's like chomping at the bit. If there was sort of a nerd series that I was into, uh, you know, in kind of my not formative years, but you know, teens and college time frame would have been um, would have been Battlestar Galactica. Um, I'm hesitant to say you it will did be. it only because of the hot woman in the red dress. <laughs> oh, no. no, not at all. I was all you know the the idea of a of a military type show that actually showed combat. I think you know we forget there's not a lot of shows on TV that show military operations. At sort of a at a sort of admiral or fleet level, um, and and you know fighter pilots and things like that, you don't really see that on TV. You see a lot of dramas, you know, in terms of like oh relationships and stuff. Um, but even like Jag, for example, which was on forever, you know that that never really looked at combat operations until I think the very end. They had a couple of scenes where you know there were actually fighter pilots and things like that, um, but. They're all mystery, murder mystery type things, and 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 Battlestar Galactica was different. Um, I never really watched. I'm trying to think of any other shows that were out there like Stargate. I never really watched that, but that again was more of like an individual drama um, rather than like military operations where you had you know battalions of troops going into combat or things like that. At least that's my recollection. So you just it, I enjoyed it for that. Uh, and it kind of lost me as the series went a little bit down down off the rails uh, as it progressed. But the first three seasons were awesome. Um, and and uh, you know, I still go back to them and watch them watch them pretty regularly. Um, the one thing I would say is I, I has you know I, me being the voice of reason perhaps and you being the the enthusiastic, um, Star Hammer was really well regarded as a game. so my my assumption is that Battlestar Galactica will be, uh, a quality and, and polished game um, because, again, Starhammer got really positive reviews. I wonder, I know I know Marco told you in his interview that, um, you know, they it was a natural partnership and that, you know, it wasn't hard for them to get, to get the rights. We don't know what that means, right? Are they paying a licensing fee for every single copy sold? Did they have to pay a big boatload of cash up front? Somehow I doubt it, giving Matrix a size. But I just—it's one of those things where I wonder, how many copies do they have to sell to break even? Are they are they really banking on on it being a hit, or is it one of those things where they could sell a whole boatload of copies and not actually make a ton of money because of whatever their licensing deal is? Like I don't know. I mean, it, it could be a hit from a game sales perspective. I think you're right. I think compared to what Matrix does, uh, typically in terms of how many games they sell, I think it will be you know very well regarded. But I don't. You know, whether this means Matrix is going to do a lot more of these kind of deals, which is what I'm trying to get at. Um, I think a lot of that depends on the contract terms that neither you nor I have any visibility into. Um, but I, I just hesitate with, with any kind of big IP like this. You know, it, it can't be easy for Matrix to, to get these kind of licenses, even if it's a natural partnership, even if, you know, the, the partner was willing. We don't know what willing means, right? We don't know if that means they get a, a, a revenue off, you know, a share of every single copy sold. And then at that point, you know, you get into kind of um, trying to understand, well, does it make sense for Matrix developers to spend time doing this if however many dollars out of every copy sold is, is part of like a licensing deal? Or, or does it make sense to make a game that's going to sell one-tenth the number of units, but it all flows back to them? Like... I, I don't know. I, just, I my my only point is that without knowing the details of the contract, I don't think we can really understand what qualifies as a hit for them. I wonder if uh, bringing because uh, I, I talked to him about um, Xbox and PS4, and they were bringing this. Uh, they're bringing, I believe, this game to both Xbox uh, One and PS4, um, and he was saying that that they're doing this because it's a big opportunistic uh, platform. Um, as long as you get they get the UI controls right, uh, it's a very big platform to reach out to. And um, there's a, I think there's even, I mean, there's a big audience uh, playing on those consoles. So I feel like, you know, if they released it for PC, it'd be great. I, I'm assuming they would make, uh, you know, they would make a healthy revenue. But I think expanding it to Xbox and PS uh, is is definitely going to bring in the boatloads of money that I think 
I won't say over, it won't, I'm trying to be careful with my words. I don't think it's going to eclipse like paradox sales, but I think it's going to be in the realm of where paradox, because I think they're breaking into a, you know, Man, the PS4. You are optimistic the X about this thing. Like, I don't, <laughs> I'm excited about it. I really am, but I, I temper expectations. Well, I, I it's going to happen. It's like, because, you know, there's, there's millions of people that love Battlestar Galactica. Now, like, if still? you load up your PS4. Still, and... do you think there's still millions of people that are out there sitting oh, yeah, and definitely. waiting for I a mean, Battlestar like... Galactica game? I, I, I think so, because, you know, even when I was like, even my friends or even my like friends at Apple, like even when I was at Apple, like we were uh, bullshitting about like, uh, like Battlestar like a year ago. And the show has been off for like five years. And they're like, yeah, man, I love Battlestar. I, you know, I watch every couple of years. So I feel like there's they're still there. And I feel like and they're big PS4 and Xbox One players. So like if they turn on their console and like the first thing they see is, battle, you know, Battlestar Galactica, Deadlock. You know, they're going to like click on and say, holy shit, this is actually pretty good. Now, for the right price, I don't know what the price range would be for a game like this. You know, uh, what they're willing to spend between uh, I'm assuming between 20 and 40, you know, and nothing higher than 40. But somewhere in that realm, um, I could see them just saying, yeah, let me buy this. And then and getting people like that in their 20s and um, early 30s picking up this game. Because honestly, if like I was picking up a PS4 and I saw it, and if it was for the right price between like 20 and $30, uh, even 40, I would be like, click, good. And because uh, I mean, honestly, like there hasn't been any Battlestar games that have ever really came out. I mean, you had the online, whatever, online multi MMO, but it was like a crap fest. It was it was complete shit on a stick, you know. Uh, and then you had the uh, then there, there's some iOS games for it, which are just oh gosh, man. Um, so this is actually the first real Battlestar Galactica game, and it's an actual strategy game made by an actual strategy developer. And you know, I feel based on the graphics, the way the tactical simulation was that I saw. Um, it's 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 to me it just screams win and you know when you have these big sites like polygon polygon only goes like polygon and the verge and all these other uh uh site GameSpot and uh, ign they, they they like they talk about the big titles they talk about like call of duty's coming out or we have um that new uh, God of War, I think. Yeah, that's a new uh, game that's coming out for PS4. They talk about titles like that. For them to go on and put it on their front pages like Battlestar Galactica coming this summer looks great. You know, uh, this is the Battlestar Galactica we've been waiting for. You know, it, I, I feel like they're stirring the pot. And barring any unforeseen circumstances, this game releases and it does, you know, it, it, it's beautiful, no bugs, nothing. I mean, you know, that doesn't cripple gameplay. People are just going to swarm at it. And I feel like this is just going to like push Slytherin to say, look, we made an incredible amount of money doing this. Let's do the same thing for another IP, whether that be Star Trek, Star Wars, or I don't know, Harry Potter. I don't, not Harry Potter, but whatever. What are they going to do with Harry Potter? <laughs> whatever other strategy, uh, I mean, IP that we can do. But, uh, I'm, I'm going maybe, to maybe I, I don't again I, I don't want to crush your enthusiasm I, I just I think we should temper expectations yes you know I think it was Charlie Hall wrote a really interesting piece on it and talked about kind of the game um, but I mean they've covered previous Matrix games they they covered Heroes in Normandy um, you know Charlie Hall wrote an article on that on Polygon I don't think it was front page but it was still on their site they had um, Rob Zachney wrote a feature like an actual feature article for them years ago on uh, the death of, of Mad Minute Games, which is kind of the Take Command developer that merged into or, you know, transformed into Scourge of War. He talked about kind of that. Now, that was more of a, like, a developer sort of story and, and kind of that, I think, was, first of all, it was brilliantly done, like, from a from a writing standpoint, really, really kind of drew you in. But, uh, again, I mean, they, they had Warhammer 40K, and I don't know how that's done for them, and that was a big IP for them. So I guess... You know, we'll see. I, I, I'm glad to see it. I think it'll be a lot of fun to play. Um, I'll leave the business side to Matrix and let them figure out if this is, you know, successful and if they want to launch launch more of these kind of games. And I certainly would be thrilled with a, a Star Wars game. Um, something tells me Disney would probably be a lot more difficult and, and de demanding in terms of licensing rights. Um, but, um, you know, and maybe a Star Trek. Would be more difficult than CBS? 
Yes. Yes, no doubt. I mean, Star Wars. There, it's literally like the biggest fan. It's literally. I mean, I don't want to start a flame war between Star Trek and Star Wars fans, but at least today, like right now, it is the biggest sci-fi franchise out there. Yeah, well, you know, who well, knows with the new maybe with the new Star Trek they'll they'll have a resurgence. I don't know, but right now it is it is the biggest sci-fi franchise with one of the biggest media companies in the world. But do you I feel mean, like they're not taking advantage of it? Because it's like, what, uh, like, it, it, my, like, I watched all of E3, and I remember I was going through all the keynotes for uh, Sony and uh, Microsoft and all of them. And I only recall, like, one Star Wars game, uh, which was, you know, um, Battlefront, Battlefront 2. They have the IP, the Star Wars IP, which is a huge IP. Whoa, it's whoa, in- whoa. Let me stop you there. I mean, very different types of games. But Battlefront, the original, was a classic. Um, they're was, making yeah. new ones, you know, with EA, whatever. The, it's called, the, the it's, 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 it's and, Battlefront. Um, but it, it, so don't forget about the Old Republic. You know, that was a classic RPG um, that people still regard as one of the greatest games of all time. Um, or sorry, the Knights of the Old Republic. Oh, yeah. Um They've got the MMO that's still out there that had a huge audience when it first came out. I know it bled and went to went to free to play, but it's still around. They're still releasing expansions for it. I think that was, um, I think that one's the Old Republic. Um, I mean, they've had a whole bunch of Jedi game like Jedi Academy, Jedi Outcast. They had the whole Star Killer franchise with. Um, that was goodness. good. I can't remember the name of the games, the, the actual games, but so I mean they've had a lot of games out there. At least um, I they had uh, what was it Empire at War, which is kind of like a an RTS type game uh, with yeah, some strategy good. elements. That was a very good game. That was when that was when Lucas Arts on the that was when Lucas uh, on the IP when Disney got it. Like Disney got it like a year or two ago when they came out with the uh, Harrison, uh, you know, Episode Seven, I believe. Right. So between Episode Seven. They came out with episode seven. They came out with the the great film that just came out last year, which was um, with that girl, with that British girl. I forgot her name. Um, you know which one I'm talking about? The uh, Rogue One. That's it. Yeah. And then we have the new one coming out, episode eight this year. If you take all these three films, this is kind of like their golden years. This is where like everybody wants Star Wars. This they want the Star Wars Pez collector. This that whatever everything. They only have they only released one game, which is battlefront really i mean you have these little small little garbage little you know probably an app here or this and that but like one real game which is battlefront okay, i mean I think- come on the mmo is still out there again it's not it's not world of warcraft by any me- by any measure but it's still no, but it was not started by disney disney did like disney has the ip they got the yeah, ip but they and paid they said, for it i'm start, sure let's make episode seven and I like if I was on that room, I would say, "All right, we're gonna make episode seven. Let's tie in as much stuff that we can with the release of the film. So we know it's gonna be a hit because everybody's gonna want to see Harrison Ford. You know, they're gonna see um, um, Carrie Fisher and uh, you know all the legends, right? Let's make I don't know play though. Let's make everything. Let's make a, 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 a you know a Battlefront. Let's make a strategy game, uh, Star Wars. Let's make a, ba- a board game. I would push everything out there and." They did for certain things, but not for – they just only made Battlefront. It's just like I want something more. Make a couple more. Make another uh, Star Wars Empire War II. Make another you know, Unleashed game with, the, with that – I think that was the one uh, that, we were talk, uh, that we were talking about. Make another Knights of the Old Republic. You know, push stuff out there that people want to consume. And I want another um, – what was that old game from 99? I forgot, or 98. That was, that was better than Empire War. It's escaping me. I always bring it up on the podcast, but I, I can't can't think of it. It was uh, Star Wars. Um, damn it! It was it was one of their best uh, strategy games. It was like ninety eight. And the the name is escaping me, but they don't make any of that anymore. And it's just it's just Battlefront at this point. And you have the you have the MMO, but it's the steam on that is kind of fading away. So like, I, I kind of blame them because it's like you have the uh, IPO make something with it you know it's the same thing with star trek you know like i i just found out one of the um over the last week that uh there was this indie developer they made a literally 
a deck by deck simulation of the enterprise right that you know captain kirk's ship you know like you can go down people are walking down the hallway and you can say hey you look at this hot girl walking by and some model whatever but you're like holy crap you know this is the enterprise i'm a, i'm in dr mccoy's quarters all that stuff and it was an awesome simulation it was for nerds like you know trekkies like me you know and i loved it and they took it down because cbs was like well we you know wanted to take it down because it was going to interfere or whatever I'm like i, I think I, what you're missing is that especially with disney just taking over the ip i think they're they're lucas films and, and lucas whatever everything lucas uh was very open to saying hey you want to write a book about star wars fine uh everyone could kind of create their own expanded universe and they all kind of tried to figure out ways to make sure they were all meshed together everyone could kind of create their own games and create their own history and i think disney is much more of a traditional corporation and that they want to kind of control the message and, and the branding and uh, to some extent, that's annoying, and I know a lot of EU fans are kind of frustrated that a lot of the, the history has been thrown out. I actually just recently read through the Thrawn books, and I found them great, um, and I had never read them till now. To me, it doesn't take anything away to say they're not technically canon anymore. But I think what you're seeing with Disney is a desire to control the future of the series, and I think to some extent, especially strategy games, less so a first-person shooter. You know, Battlefront can get away with it because it's... Um, it's not really changing any stories. It's just people running around and shooting each other and using, you know, your characters that already exist in the in, in the franchise. And maybe the Old Republic, to a certain extent, again, it predated Disney owning the series, but it also is kind of so far in the in the in the past from a Star Wars perspective that it doesn't necessarily threaten any kind of storylines that they're trying to go for now. But I think the difficulty that Disney has is they want to control the message and they want to control kind of what the history of Star Wars is. And if they let all these strategy game developers in to do whatever the heck they want to do, strategy games intuitively are storytelling devices. And, you know, if you're allowing other people to create new stories, you're allowing them to change what what the history of Star Wars is. And if they've made this concerted effort to lock down the history of the Star Wars universe to being what they want it to be, then you can't just turn around and say, oh, great, let's open this up to literally anyone and their brother and let them all make Star Wars games. Now, maybe it will happen, um, but I just, I, I, I just am trying to temper expectations. The, the intent wasn't necessarily for us to... <laughs> I'm sure everyone is interested in this, but I'm not sure the intent in, in my comment was to say, oh, no, Star Wars will never happen. I just think we need to be realistic and, and look at what Disney's been doing, and I just don't see them opening up the franchise to someone like Matrix who doesn't, you know, if you're Disney, and this is not meant as, as any kind of criticism of Matrix. I love a lot of their games. I play a lot of their games on my channel. But let's be honest. They're not EA. They're not um, Bioware. They're not a huge development studio that can guarantee millions of fans will flock to any game they release. So... If you're Disney and, and this company comes up to you and says, we want to do something with your IP, and you've been doing a lot of work to try and you know control the IP, are you really going to turn over your IP to a studio that, what do they bring? A couple thousand, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, maybe a couple hundred thousand at the most you know, devoted strategy fans to the title? You, Disney, and, and, and Star Wars, you bring all the rest. It's not to say you wouldn't partner with them. I'm not trying to get into Matrix's business. I'm just I'm just thinking we need to temper expectations on what is down the line. You know, maybe obviously Marco knows better than either you or I. We're just speculating. But maybe they've got some kind of agreement that they're thinking about that might make sense. But I think to assume that it will allow Matrix to become the next paradox and become a multi, you know, tens of millions of dollars in annual sales and go IPO and have their stock double in the course of a year I think that's asking a lot because at the end of the day, any agreement there is going to be heavily in favor of Disney, in my view, uh, just because, again, Disney's the one who's bringing 99% of anyone who's going to buy that game to the game if it's a success. Yeah, I think you're right about this because, you know, I, you know, laying it out like that, it, I, I, I kind of agree with you, you know. Just from a business perspective, again, no, I, I would love to see it. I would love to see them do it. I, I just don't want to see Matrix jump into bed with a whole bunch of big IPs and and mortgage their future on on these I things being hugely successful the expanded universe i forgot that they kicked everybody like so basically they're not making any more but like so anything that 
is release Star Wars has to be canon and approved by Disney at this point, right? I think I'm not really sure because there was a recent Thrawn book that came out that was about like Thrawn's sort of the birth the birth of Thrawn, uh, not the birth, but sort of his like the prequel to the trilogy that was written in the 90s. I don't know if that's considered canon or not. I'm not really clear on that. I'm not really up into the into the EU universe either, so it's it's hard for me to tell. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to say that um, you know, the it's great that they're doing Battlestar Galactica. I'm really excited about that. That is, you know, one of the one of the few TV shows that I watch, you know, growing up. I didn't watch a ton of TV. And I am going to enjoy playing it, and or I think I will. You know, hopefully I will. We'll see when it comes out. And anything else beyond that is gravy, and I'll leave the business side of things to Matrix, and they can figure out what makes sense. I just I don't want to see them mortgage their future to get a whole bunch of big IPs if it doesn't make sense. But that's up to them. They'll do what they'll do what they need to do. And uh, as a as a individual playing games, I will just hope that uh, they continue to make good games. I think that if uh, I'm hoping that if this game does well, which I, I believe it will, but with this game going well, uh, that they're going to be able to make about a Star Galactica 2, uh, you know, a sequel to this uh, Deadlock series as a continuation of the campaign or something like that. And hopefully they can touch on the new, uh, you know, the actual second Cylon War, because that's I think that's something that would be really amazing where you, you're a commander of a battle star and you have to like run away, like you have to kind of like avoid Cylons and that whole search for the new Earth. I think like that would be a great game where you're in charge of the Galactica and you got to salvage the fleet. And I mean, would you think something like that would be a good game where you're in charge of the Galactica and you're, you're making those command decisions that Dama would make? Uh, sending the fleet here, and let's try this planet. What do you think? Something like that. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I think um, it could make a good RPG, but I almost think a more open, not necessarily open world, but I almost think pre-Clone uh, War Two would be more interesting because I think they've got a lot more flexibility without changing the actual canon of the series. I think they've got a lot more flexibility and open openness to be able to play with the pre-Clone War not, oh my god, Clone War. The pre um, like <laughs> the pre second Cylon War, I think is more is is better suited to a game. You got Star Wars on your mind. <laughs> yeah, apparently it's all your fault. Again, I, I I'm just trying to be rational and reasonable and I don't want to get in no, in you. Matrix's you're, you're business right again. I mean, Star Wars, Star Trek, if if they can do it, great. Um, but let's let's enjoy what they're giving us. I think Battlestar Galactica is, you know, is are we in agreement? It's it's safe to say it's nowhere near the level of Star Trek or or, or Star Wars in terms of fandom. Yeah, that's right, because Star Trek is you know way above Battlestar Galactica. I have to. Yeah. Either one, I think, is in terms of their fan base anyway. Um, and who knows? Like, is, does Universal have any plans for the future of Battlestar Galactica? They may not. In which case, great, we can make a little bit of money selling a game, right? Like, I don't, I don't know what their future holds. I, I think everybody knows Star Trek is, you know, they have a new TV series coming out, so there's a future there. Star Wars obviously has a very long future ahead of it, but we don't know about Battlestar Galactica. They haven't released anything for BSG in five years. 2012 was the last that. one that came out. And the series ended all the way back in 2009. So, you know, that's going on a decade. So, you know, if they don't, if there's no real intent for them to continue that IP, or if they do, maybe they'll completely reimagine it again and, and you'll have a whole new set of canon. But if, <laughs> I mean, that, that's what Hollywood does, right? Everything just gets remastered and redone and kind of, oh, let's start everything over again. Another Spider Man movie. Yeah. So I just. I, you know, I'm I'm excited for it. Let's let's just enjoy uh, enjoy that they're they're taking this challenge on and see uh, how it works out and, and leave it. So is there. that the top game you're looking for? like? So if you had to put Battlestar Galactica and everything else coming out this summer, which one is going to be? Which one's on top of your list? What else is coming out this summer? I got Gettysburg the tight. Uh, hopefully, Gettysburg the tight turns. Uh, okay. it's supposed to be out soon. Um, uh, you got a uh, damn. I hold hold on. I had a whole list, but you got like um. Damn it, my mind's going blank here. Uh, so, the, you know, um, Matrix has a whole bunch of the titles coming out this uh, fall, this summer here. Let me go to the website. You guys are probably beating me to the website here. Uh, um, I'm not doing anything. I'm just letting you do everything. I'm sipping on my scotch <laughs> over here. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
I heard some uh, injury. Oh, so it looks like uh, Afghanistan 11 is getting some new features. Um, beta test. Here we go. All the beta. Uh, so it looks like a new Wars of Secession is coming out. Art of War 4. Uh, something called Mayor Nostrum. And these are all in beta, so I don't know exactly when these are coming out. But uh, yeah, obviously, they're in beta. They're close. Uh, Desert War. Um and I heard, you know, when I was talking to Marco, he was also mentioning something about uh, that they're redoing. I said, what was the most challenging project that you guys are working on in Slytherin? He says, one of the most challenging projects is a renewal of the close combat engine. So, I'm, I, you know, it's not coming out anytime soon, but that's on the, it's on the board, you know? Yeah, and I think they've talked about that a bit. I'm, I'm intrigued to see what that'll look like. So if you had to, like, choose any of those games, the one from a a a Aged... Aged, I don't know how to pronounce their studio name. I'm just going to say Aged, uh, Gettysburg, the Titans, Art of War, uh, Desert War, all these games uh, from Slytherin. Uh, is Battle Star on the top of your list? Probably. Um, it's, you know, I don't know if it's ahead of Cold Waters, which I've been absolutely loving, which we'll probably talk about here in a minute, but um, it's certainly up there in terms of uh, games that I'm excited about. I just don't have a ton of games that I'm excited about right now. So this kind of caught my fancy, and I kind of saw it, and I was like, wow, this looks really cool. And I watched a bit of the the reveal trailer or stream, and it was awesome. And, um, you know, that was all – it was all well and good, and I, I look forward to seeing it. But I guess, you know, to be honest, Gettysburg, Tide Turn, that's a Shenandoah, Shenandoah studio. Like, I know they don't exist as an entity anymore, but that's their IP, right, that was bought from them. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was uh, I think, like a year or two ago, and Slytherin took the, um, took the lead on that, and uh, they, they've been working on it, um, and, you know, there were some difficulties. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, like, a couple of people at Slytherin told me what was going on, so it's, it's in, in process, they were telling me. Um, but you know, I keep hoping, and they, they're getting um, they're getting some leeway, and it was it it, it has to deal with. Um, uh, a really major portion of the game that they're working on that they want to make sure that everything's good to go. Uh, and, you know, take your time. Uh, when the game releases, it releases. I'm, you know, I'm, okay. I'm one of the original Kickstarter backers, so I, I have my patience after, like, <laughs> how long ago was that? That was, like, what, 2013? That originally Kickstarter or 2012? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, honestly, you're more clued into the mobile scene than I am, and I guess... You know, nothing against the game. I enjoy Carrier Deck, which is obviously it's a kind of cross between mobile and PC. And Panzer General or Panzer Core is a great game, and that's on mobile and, and PC. But um, I'm not as clued into the Shenandoah Studio piece because my experience was they were always, when they existed, were always strictly mobile. And I guess mm -hmm. I just didn't really, first of all, the only iPad I've ever had was an iPad, the original iPad Mini. Um, oh. So I'm not really. You know, I've got a Samsung Tab Three. I use I use my tablets more for reading than I do for gaming. Yeah, I was, so when I was talking to um, that was kind of like the biggest thing that uh, hit me in the last interview. I was talking to him and I asked him. Um, I said, "What is what is the outlook for strategy gaming on uh, tablets?" Because you know that's a big thing with me. And uh, the thing that killed me, I didn't I didn't do it in the podcast, but I was like, ah. Uh, he said the major risk. They said the main issues uh, with porting games to iPad is the risk. And he says, um, and I think I quote, he says, porting of any of the big games is not possible right now. So my 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 vision of Civil War II on the iPad is faded into dust. <laughs> I think if you look at any game that has a really robust UI, I think it's going to be challenging. You yeah. know, if you've got like 40 ribbon tabs along the top, you're going to be in trouble trying to put that on mobile. He was saying you have to redesign the games from scratch when with uh, those kind of UIs. So I can and imagine at that point, unless they can guarantee huge sales, like, does it even make sense? I think, you know, I, I know you mentioned them bringing, uh, don't want to belabor the point on Battlestar, but you mentioned them bringing that to PS4. I think it's worth pointing out that the developer that's working on that made Star Hammer. I have already said this a few times couple of years ago, but that was already on PS4. So I'm sure they've got a UI that they already used for that, that they're probably just bringing over. I'm really curious to see how different the game is. Is it just a new storyline with like the same, you know, core elements to gameplay or is it like a whole new game? I'm not quite sure. I haven't, I haven't looked into Starhammer enough to know. 
Um, but with that being said, I mean, I think Battlestar is clearly the most, uh, the game I'm the most excited about. Um, I think the game I'm enjoying most right now that's already out is a game called Cold Waters. Now, I know you haven't had a chance to play Cold Waters yet. Um, I've watched, uh, I watched some, I'm planning to play it tomorrow, but I, I saw a lot of your uh, podcasts, I mean, your uh, streams. Yeah, it was, it's been a lot of fun so far. And, um, you know, I've, I was a big fast attack fan, like way back in the day in, in Sierra days. Um, uh, I think that was maybe Sierra, yeah. And uh, that was a lot of fun uh, for me, uh, kind of taking the helm of a you know six six eight or what six eight eight I the the improved LA class. Uh, and that game I still think has the best interface of any that submarine simulator. Story? No, just the 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 most modern version of the uh, Los Angeles class. Um, the, is Los Angeles class ballistic, or is that attack sub? No, it's a it's an attack sub. So SSN stands for I don't know. I've had multiple people debate me on what the SS piece of it stands for, but the N stands for nuclear, which just means that it's a you know nuclear powered fast attack submarine. SS is like a fast attack sub. Uh, if it's diesel powered, usually it's SSK. If it's nuclear powered, it's usually SSN. Uh, ballistic missile subs that would be the Ohio class and their SSBNs which stands for you know ballistic for ballistic missile and then N for nuclear powered uh, okay but um so, you know yeah, I you really enjoy the game I you were really getting into it yeah I've really enjoyed it I know it's very much sort of a spiritual successor to Red Storm Rising which was kind of a classic in the 80s which I never really played uh, but it's it's been a lot of fun and um it's one of those games that I, I wonder, I've played maybe 30 hours of it so far, which for me is a lot. I know for some people it's not. I wonder how long it's going to retain my interest because the missions can kind of get repetitive. But what really intrigued me about this game is you've got a 1984 campaign, which I've played the most of, which basically puts you in charge of more or less a modern day type nuclear submarine. You're sailing an LA, you're sailing a Sturgeon, an Arwell, a Permit, something like that. But the weapon systems are thoroughly modern. You have incredibly modern US torpedoes, the Mark 48s, uh, which are lethal as hell. They, they, good luck trying to dodge one if it acquires on you. You've got wire, you know, wire guided torpedoes that allow you to guide them largely into their targets. You've got uh, submarine launched cruise missiles like the Tomahawk uh, land attack or anti-ship. You've got the Harpoon anti-ship missile that can be launched from a submarine. So you've got a whole... It is very much a information age conflict. Not as modern and crazy as things are today, but again, still thoroughly modern. And that game is almost like a point-and-click game. To some extent, it feels a little arcadey. You can dodge torpedoes almost like you're a fighter jet dodging SAMs, it feels like. The, the degrees that you can get on your ship... I'm sure people would be vomiting all over my my submarine <laughs> if I'm you know 30 degree up angle with you know full ballast you know full ballast driving me upwards as well you know going from 600 feet to 100 feet in a matter of a minute or two, but um, in some and you've got this exterior it's a 3D almost like a third person shooter game where you've got an exterior view of your ship so again it's it's a little bit arcadey at times. But it is a whole bunch of fun. But the interesting, Let me ask you yeah. Wait, do you prefer a game like that where you get like an exterior 3D view, or do you like something like? Do you remember the silent? I think it was the Silent Hunter games that mm -hmm. came out where like um, you get, get to command the sub. It was like a World War II, I believe. Uh, it was a big one where it was everything was 3D graphical. You were like an actual um, sailor captain inside the sub and you see people moving around and you go to different stations, you can, um, uh, play with the knobs and stuff like that. Cause I, like you were saying, this is like a 3d, uh, view of the outside. Do you prefer the outside or a game that like does the inside where you're kind of like a member of the crew? You can do an exterior view for silent hunter for what it's worth. Um, but it doesn't play quite as arcadey, but that's also cause those submarines moved at like five knots when they were submerged. Whereas, you know, a, a, a nuclear sub can go 30 knots when submerged. So part of that is that. Um, I don't think I have a preference. I love Silent Hunter. I played Silent Hunter 3 on a college laptop with an integrated graphics chip, and it would literally, you would get one second of gameplay for every two seconds of real life time. So it was laggy as shit. But... <laughs> 
I played it for hours and hours and hours in college, and I loved that game. I would never claim to be one of those hardcore people, like you know, a DCS sim person who 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 plays a plane from a cold start. I didn't play Silent Hunter like an arcade game, but I also didn't play it with realistic aiming. So I did everything realistic, with the exception of I'm not gonna be measuring how tall a mast is to figure out how far away. You know, like I'm not I'm not gonna be doing the crazy arithmetic uh, for aiming my torpedoes, but everything else. Uh, which, admittedly, that's probably one of the more difficult pieces. But everything else I played, I played it in, in a realistic manner. I didn't use the exterior camera, but it was there if you wanted it. So, I mean, I love that game. Um, but, I don't know, there's there's somewhat of an appeal to Cold Waters with this kind of arcade look at it as well, which is very much in the Red Storm Rising vein. So, again, I don't I don't think it's necessarily... I prefer one or the other. I think it's what I'm looking to get out of the game, and I will say that playing this game makes me want to go back to Silent Hunter 3 or Silent Hunter 4, load up some mods like the you know the Grey Wolf's mod, and uh, maybe do a series or two on that and kind of look at the World War II subs and, and talk a little bit about history because that's what I've been doing is I've, I've been basically saying, all right, I showed a bunch of gameplay footage where I talked about the game, but what can I do that's a little bit different? And what I've been doing is talking about the history of some of the boats while I've been playing and, and kind of my plan is to go through the entire Cold War and talk about all the different classes of submarines and kind of their iteration from from design to implementation, how they were used, how if they were successful or not. And um, you know, I, I I think it could be interesting to do a World War II series as well. Um, but long story short, I really enjoy Cold Waters. The interesting piece to the game that I was kind of mentioning earlier, and that really throws me. Is 1984, your sonar is so good, your weapons are so good, it feels like an arcade game in that see target, point at target, shoot at target. The game does everything for you. Uh, you know, and you've got to do all this maneuvering and all that, but like at the end of the day, you don't need to try that hard to sink enemy submarines. The game has two campaigns. It has a 1984 campaign, which is what I'm talk talking about. It has a 1968 campaign which plays like an entirely goddamn different game. I swear, it is... That is... That's like I'm playing Silent Hunter. Where hmm. things are... Your torpedoes are shit. You've got a decent <laughs> unguided torpedo that, you know, you can hit targets with. But it's unguided. So if they maneuver at all, you're screwed. you got to get in super close. And remember, it's 68. So it's not quite... Ships aren't as stupid as they were in, in, uh, in, in, in World War II. Um, your your guided torpedo moves at like eight knots. The thing takes like an hour to close on a target, and as soon as they detect it, they just turn around and run, and you're never going to catch them. It is an entirely different game. You have to figure out, all right, you got to get in their baffles, you've got to uh, maneuver in super close. It's it's a much more tactical and difficult game than than the 84 campaign. And I just find that fascinating that a game with the same design, the same mechanics, the weapon systems are just so vastly different depending on the year that you're playing the game in. Um, it's almost like two games in one. And I haven't huh. grown to love the 68 campaign yet. I love that they tried. I love that it's in there, but it's frustrating as hell for me to play. Um, but with that said, um, you know, I, I enjoy it. And... Um, you know, it's it's right now. It's my favorite game that I'm playing, and I hope it stays that way. Um, you know, Battlestar is probably gonna gonna compete with it for a bit until I can figure out if it's a good game or not. You know, and maybe it'll maybe it will replace it if it is. But I, um, I seen Cold Harbor. You got like uh, Cold Waters. I'm sorry. The uh, like when I was watching it, uh, I'm looking through his screenshots now. You got like a uh, a view of like uh, Soviet Union, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, UK. Iceland and you got like icons on the screen representing boats and planes and stuff like that. Is there like a sandbox or a campaign where you're like telling where these units are going or is this just like... So it's kind of like uh, Silent Hunter in that you'll get orders from your, your fleet to say go here and do this. Um, okay. The missions get pretty repetitive so um, there's like six or maybe five or six missions typically that you get. You could get orders to launch tomahawks on a port. You could get it orders to intercept enemy fast attack subs, diesel subs, guided missile subs. Uh, kind of the end game scenario is intercepting enemy ballistic missile subs, making sure they can't you know, come to the U.S. coast. 
Um, so there's a series of missions that you kind of cycle through and the game will give you. And this, this map of Europe that you're talking about is dynamic. It does change. So based on, you know, how you're doing or, or whatnot, the war progresses almost in the Falcon 4.0 way. If you do really well in your missions, the war goes well and you win. If you do poorly, the war goes poorly and you lose. Um, the only thing is that kind of the boss battle at the end against the SSBNs, the the guided uh, the ballistic missile subs. If you lose that, no matter how well you're doing, it kind of ends in a draw um, to to replicate. You know, the enemy basically making demands of you're not going to uh, you know castrate us in this game uh, or in this in this war because if you do, we'll just nuke you. Um, but uh, so World War III has been de- declared in this game. Yes, this is a World War Three game. I may have neglected to say that, but this is a uh, based sort of off the premise of, of Red Storm Rising, the book where, you know, the Soviet Union launches an attack into Western Europe and you're commanding a submarine trying to stop them. Now, the game will also have a Soviet campaign that the developers are working on right now when they have said will come out. Um, so that will uh, that will add the Soviet side. Right now you only play as a U.S. ballistic or U.S. fast attack submarine. But the game will be adding a um, a, a Soviet campaign as well. Uh, in addition, I believe they may be working on some, I don't know if they're working on like other wars or other theaters, or I'm not really sure, but I believe there's other work they're doing or thinking about. So for all we know, maybe they'll, you know, introduce another theater, another campaign, another country. I think I've seen some people throw around the idea of them, including like French submarines and British submarines. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if that means maybe they'd add like Chinese submarines, but then if you're doing China, does it make sense to do like an eighties conflict? Maybe would they bring it forward to like present day? I, I don't know. You know, I don't know what they're doing, but, um, they've also made a big point of this game being highly moddable. So it'd be kind of cool. Like you could create your own campaigns theoretically, um, where maybe you create like a modern day world war three against Russia or not Russia against China. Um, you know, where you've got like Virginia class boats against, against Chinese boats. I, I don't know, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, some, uh, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to this game because it's, uh, it's not like the Naval fleet action game that I want, but I really like, uh, submarine games. Uh, I, I really kind of fell in love with the silent hunter games because, uh, you kind of have control of the sub, you're the captain, but you are also like inside the ship, so you get to like see the crew, even though they're like just 3D simula, you know, they're just 3D simulations, and they're just you know being uh, looped, uh, you know, a sprite loop. But it's it, it kind of immerses you. Um, but this kind of looks really cool, especially since it's a World War Three kind of uh, environment. Yeah, they're different games. So I mean, Silent Hunter is more like a role playing game to me, right? It's like an RPG where you're just limited to inside your sub. Um, I wouldn't call this game a role-playing game. This one is more like a third-person shooter with a dynamic campaign. This is like Falcon 4.0 in that, you know, you're an individual captain as you were an individual pilot. Your success or failure kind of determines the result of the war, but there's no real story around it. To me, Silent Hunter is much more than that. To me, Silent Hunter is a storytelling uh, platform, uh, which, you know, allows you to uh, kind of give... uh, Put your shoes in, 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 put yourself in the shoes of a U-boat captain in a way that this game doesn't do, which is fine. You know, they're trying to do for, do different things. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that I'm gonna play over the next couple of days, and maybe on the next podcast we can uh, debate and see uh, see how I feel about it. Uh, yeah, but I mean, based on your um, videos, it looked really good. So I'm yeah, it's a, lot, it's a lot of fun. It's it's relatively intuitive if you play the 84 campaign. The 68 campaign, as I said, is, is a whole different animal. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but uh, overall, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, you know, it's there's there is something to that level of information that you get that I think being able to see more it in some scenarios removes some immersion, but in other scenarios it really makes you think, wow, they did a great job with this. I know there was a scenario where I had attacked an enemy surface fleet, there were enemy patrol craft airborne above me, and I was trying to extricate myself, you know, to get out of get out of the area. And they laid a line of sonar buoys oh, that wow. almost shielded the remaining surface fleet. So the the aircraft laid a line of buoys between me and the fleet. So I was trying to get away, but I was trying to come back in for another attack. So I was I ended up running parallel to where these sonar buoys were, and it was like if I wanted to come back in and attack again, I'd have to expose myself because I was going to have to go right by those buoys. But that fleet was moving on a parallel course to those buoys, so it was perfectly positioned, and it felt like 
what a what a surface commander would do after a, a contact with an enemy sub is they'd probably lay a shield around the the, the force to try and see one if there's anybody still there but two also to maybe discourage uh, a further attack meanwhile you've got helicopters coming in with their dipping sonar trying to find you and, and drop torpedoes on you um it's just it's a really well done game and and um it feels like they they got a lot of things right ai submarines aren't great um but it's interesting too because russian passive sonar was shit american subs always relied on their passive sonar basically we don't send any noise transmissions out we just got headphones on. We're listening to the water, basically, right? Jonesy from Hunt, The Hunt for Red October. <laughs> Soviet submarines had god-awful passive sonar. And so their tactic was much more to rely on active sonar. So, you know, they weren't always pinging away. That would obviously give away their position. But if they thought there was an American there, an American wasn't going to throw an active sonar ping out, uh, except in maybe really rare circumstances, they had no need. But the Russians would rely on that regularly. So all of a sudden, you start getting pinged by enemy sonars, you're wondering, all right, are they lining up their, their firing solution? And it's a very different experience to, you know, being engaged by a, a passive sonar where, you know, a fish would just be in the water without you knowing. So I'm really curious to see how the game will handle, um, you know, the, the Soviet campaign where you've got some really interesting boats like the Alpha, uh, which can is basically the Ferrari of underwater, uh, but uh, is loud as hell. You know, you can dive super deep. You can go really fast. But everyone's going to hear you five miles away, uh, whereas the U.S. boats are almost the exact opposite. A lot of the U.S. boats are relatively slow compared to their Soviet counterparts, but they've got killer sensors, um, and they uh, and they have great weapons platforms. So it'll be interesting to see. One game I want that is, I, I would love to find is to replicate a game that makes me like... I would say maybe they'll say, add the Canadian submarines. Who knows? I don't. I didn't know this until I was doing some research for the series. But did you know the Canadians had a nuke? They were developing a nuclear-powered submarine in like the seventies and eighties. But the U.S. basically came in and said, "Yeah, you're not doing that." Really? Yeah. So I think it was called the Canada class. I could be wrong. Not a ballistic missile submarine. Just no, a, just a fast attack sub. Uh, okay. <laughs> And the U.S. was like, oh, we got this side of the world. We don't need you to get involved. They, they said something about it would, you know, destabilize the, the region that U.S. nukes and Soviet or and, and Canadian nukes would kind of get in each other's way. Basically, don't worry about it, Canada. We got this. Stick to your diesel boats. When, when, I would love a game like this or, you know, maybe a, a third party to make. A game that kind of puts me in the shoes of, uh, do you remember, uh, the, damn it, what was that movie with uh, Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman? You remember that one? It was a submarine. Crimson Tide. Yeah, Crimson Tide. That was a good movie. Uh, I would love to role play, you know, one of those commanders, you know, trying to get information. You know, I'm not saying like role play like there's a mutiny on board, but be like, you know, a U.S. ballistic missile submarine in the middle of a cold, hot, cold war, right? Needing to analyze things. And, you know, you got, uh, 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 rebel forces, rebel submarines trying to take you out and you're trying to defer, decide, like, should I launch my nukes? Uh, I can't get up top side to uh, get the communications from U.S. Uh, Northern Command. You know, a, a game like that would be really kind of cool to, uh, to to immerse yourself into. Because, uh, I, I mean, honestly, who, who doesn't want to be Gene Hackman in that movie? Um, you want to be Gene Hackman? Wasn't he, he kind of the villain? He was the he was the villain at movie. Well, sort of the villain. Yeah, right? let's launch nukes. Stylish. Let's let's launch nukes just because. Like we think the order says <laughs> they're arming their so missiles. Um, <laughs> you know, f fast attack by Sierra kind of gets a little bit of uh, of that atmosphere. In that, depending on your depth, you can get various communications. Uh, you have to put up like a VLF antenna to get communications. You've got to come up to a certain depth to get oh, certain cool. types of communications. Um, so in some sense, you know, and like your orders kind of get sent to you throughout throughout the mission. So you may only get part of it and then there will be an update. So you want to kind of come up to the surface oh, to, okay, uh, not, you know, to understand. So that game kind of gives you a little bit of that. Um, that was a 1990s, uh, 1990s game. Um, that's still one of my favorite sub sims of all time. It's, it's very much a basic interface. It's a 2D interface with these kind of interesting cut scenes when like weapons are coming in and hitting their targets. But I, I still love that game to this day. Yeah, I'll have to uh, I have to check out this uh, Cold Waters game, and uh, I'll uh, have to uh, give you my uh, my review on the next uh, podcast. Uh, yeah, I mean we should we should talk in more detail about kind of your perceptions of it. 
Um, but before we uh, head out, I wanted to. Do you mind if I uh, make a plug for my uh, for the other thing that I'm going to do? Sure. Uh, so I'm having a. Uh, the, one of the developers, uh, Johan Nagel, uh, I'm probably screwing up his name. No, Johan Nagel from Every Single Soldier. If you guys don't are not familiar with that developer, they made Vietnam 65, uh, Afghanistan 11, and Carrier Deck that we've been talking about. Uh, I'm going to have him on the uh, show for um, that other podcast, the uh, uh, War Gamers. And um, I call it, we're going to sit down with them. So if you guys have any questions that you guys want to ask, uh, every single soldier about any of those three games, you know, uh, be sure to send them in and uh, I'll be sure to ask them as long as it's, you know, appropriate. And I'd be like, hey, what are you making? You know, not any anything crazy, you know, be, you know, reasonable. Do you want to tell people where they can send those? Like, how can they send uh, them? Yeah, you can. Um, uh, where is a good place? Uh, I guess you can email it. Uh, I have an email on uh, strategywargamer.com. I forgot which one I, I listed. It might have been Gmail or the me.com. Uh, but my first and last name at me.com, if you, I'm not going to spell my whole uh, last name. It's uh, alphabet soup. But if you go to strategywargamer.com, you can um, get an email link uh, or go to Patreon. Uh, I, I set up a Patreon page where you can uh, attend the live, whatever broadcast. But uh, be sure to send questions so this way I can uh, ask him. Because uh, I'm very, I'm very, uh, very interested in uh, this uh, in this interview because uh i i am obsessed with afghanistan 11 i've been playing that game like crazy hmm. cool um well i know we've been going for almost an hour and a half now so um <laughs> yeah, probably should <laughs> probably should wrap it up before we do go though as you know this is the single malt strategy podcast so we wouldn't be uh doing our jobs if we didn't talk about uh, the adult beverage that we're drinking uh let me go wanna... first because you, you i you know you got to leave the best for last so i i uh I, i'm gonna go first and say i am drinking shit because i finished all my beers earlier today so Wait, literally uh... you're drinking shit that seems like... <laughs> chocolate flavor don't know if that's healthy dude <laughs> But no, I, I finished all my beers before, and I uh, one of my friends left their wine here, so I was like, "Shit, there's nothing to drink here." So I had, had, I've been drinking some wine with some seltzer, kind of uh, mixing that in my mouth, <laughs> you know, trying to get some kind of flavor combo there. Uh, Did you say but, you were yeah. mixing a cheap bottle of wine with a hundred dollar <laughs> bottle of wine? Did you tell me that? I, I wouldn't recommend hey, that. Keep that hundred dollar bottle of wine on its own. I want to like use that because I'm like, you know, I'm gonna give that away for like. Uh, I'm going to be cheap. So when I have to go to a family event, I got to give somebody something like, here's a hundred dollar bottle of wine that somebody gave me for free. I'm like, and they're going to be like, holy crap, this is from Swiss. You must have paid an arm and a leg. I'm like, yes. But they didn't hear that. <laughs> cool. So you're drink, you're drinking right, crappy, right, wine. crappy wine. I hope you're again, not mixing it with that good stuff, but <laughs> um, no, no, no. It's just a cheap bottle of wine that you get from, I guess, Walmart. Well, I am, you know, fittingly with the name Single Malt. I am drinking a not a bottle. I'm not drinking a bottle. I'm drinking a little bit of a bottle of 16 year old Lagavulin. I'm not Lagavulin. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but uh, it's a kind of. It's generally regarded as one of the kind of premier brands of single malt Scotch. Um, the I would argue it's probably the most well regarded that I'm aware of in the mainstream of the kind of peaty, really earthy types of scotch almost smells and tastes like charcoal it's really good it's a 16 year old bottle that i, I picked up at uh, at the store a couple of days ago and i'm having having a little bit of that i'll save the rest for for you know another time but uh, i'm enjoying that a lot man now i'm jealous i'm like damn it you told me this earlier i was like shit man <laughs> like he's having this 16 year old bottle of uh uh scotch that i'm having this so i'm gonna have to step up my game for the next podcast yeah i feel like you haven't actually had scotch ever on this podcast and again we're the single no, but... strategy podcast man you're always drinking <laughs> beer or whatever but you know like the, the the thing is like every time i go to like harrison not harrison's it was like the mall of harrison teeter right there's a alcohol place right and uh you got like a, a beer place that just has like in the uh, whatever you craft brew, uh, craft brews. And I like, I'll, I'll go in and I'm like, you know what? I can get myself a nice, good IPA. I really want the scotch, but I'm like, I'm in the beer mood for some reason. The last couple of months I've been in like a beer mood. Like, I don't know what it is. It's like, I was in a um, vodka mood back in fall or winter. Now I'm in a beer mood for the last six months. So 
I'll have to get some good vodka to drink when uh, the Soviet campaign comes out for cold waters. (laughs) Do some live streams while sipping on vodka and trying a a Russian accent that I've been told sounds Scottish uh, and that people on my videos where I have done that have asked me repeatedly, please do not try a Russian accent. Just speak normally, please. <laughs> Reminds me of like Chekhov. Uh, I remember uh, I was just watching uh, one of those things and he was saying, do you know vodka? Was, well, I'm not going to do the accent. <laughs> he was like, vodka is made by uh, a little old Russian lady. And I was like, yeah, I wonder if that's true. <laughs> like, you know, who actually invented vodka? And he was just saying on the on the movie, it was just like it was invented by this old little Russian old lady. And I'm like, I wonder if that's true. He's just bragging to this hot chick on the on the movie. Um, well, all right. With that being said, uh, I know this was kind of our first episode. Well, again, I think we posted the Memorial Day one like a month late in June. <laughs> that was on me. Um, this one I'll probably get up pretty quick. So we're kind of heading into the 4th of July weekend. So uh, before we head off, just want to wish everybody who's, you know, any anybody who's an American who's listening, happy Independence Day. Um, you know, be safe, have a good weekend, hopefully uh, good weather for you and for everybody else as well. Have, have a great weekend. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, guys, uh, this is Matt for the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. Uh, Gene, you want to send us out? See you guys.